Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Jasmine Enberg, Principal Analyst at Insider Intelligence, and I'm here in our New York headquarters today. Thank you for joining us for today's summit, our live virtual event, Attention, Seizing the Retail Media Opportunity. We are kicking things off with our keynote, Why Digital Advertising's Third Wave is Destined to be the Biggest, with my colleague, Andrew Lipsman, Principal Analyst. Afterwards, Andrew will sit down here in our New York City studio with Rich Lairfeld, Senior Vice President and General Manager at Walmart Connect for a very special fireside chat. While we won't be answering live audience questions during this session, we still want you to participate. You can use the chat window on the right to submit questions and communicate with your peers. Our backstage team will be taking note of the best questions and sending them to our Ask the Analyst panel in advance. They may be asked during that session, which I will be moderating at 2.05 p.m. Eastern. Now, there's a few ways for you to navigate this platform and make sure that you are on the latest session throughout the day. On your left is the navigation panel. The agenda button will allow you to navigate to and from sessions. You can also go to the next live session by clicking on the tab below the video named, you guessed it, next session. And if you're having any audio or video issues, please look to the tech support tab below the video for help. And now let's get to it. Over to you, Andrew. Thank you, Jasmine. So as Jasmine mentioned, I'm going to be talking about retail media in 2023, why digital advertising's third wave is destined to be the biggest. I hope to convince you of this today. So if you've been following our content over the last year or two, you've probably seen this visual in some capacity. This is digital advertising's third wave. The first wave, of course, being the rise of search advertising led by Google and then social advertising led by Facebook or Meta. Now we're into the third wave, which visually you can see is off to a really good start. But it's even more impressive than that. And this is one of the reasons why I think it's going to be the biggest. So search took 14 years to go from 1 billion in ad spend to 30 billion. Social took just 11 years. Retail media, just five years. So you can see the telescoping nature of this. And by the way, we're already past 2021. That was when that five-year horizon hit. So we're already well past it and well into the future. So retail media as a market this year in the US will be $45 billion. And we expect it to continue growing at about $10 billion a year. So there's a lot of new digital ad spend coming into retail media. The growth rates also continue to be very strong, uh, north of 20% at a time when a lot of ad markets obviously are softening. So this is in part why we have seen every single retailer flood into retail media and develop their own retail media network over the last couple of years. It really runs the gamut from digital marketplaces like Amazon and eBay to mass merchandisers like Costco, Walmart, uh, department stores like Macy's, category specialists like Kroger, Best Buy, Home Depot, commerce intermediaries like Instacart and DoorDash, and we're even getting into other commerce verticals, commerce media with something like Marriott and Marriott Media Network. Now, there's a lot flooding into the space. Many will succeed. But the question right now is really which ones have what it takes to scale. And not all of them will. But we are seeing some winners jump out in front uh, early on as this next wave takes hold. Um, so if we think about the whole digital advertising ecosystem, the duopoly of Meta and Google have started to lose their stranglehold on the market this year. You can see uh, at the end there, they're growing, we expect them to grow at you know, single digit growth rates, whereas there's a lot of other channels across retail media, big tech players like Apple and Microsoft, and some streaming players, including TikTok and Hulu, that are going to grow really fast. But retail media really steals the show. The top two players uh, on these networks that we're looking at are Walmart and Instacart, which we expect to grow north of 40% this year. Amazon in the middle there at 19% growth but on a pretty large base as the biggest player in retail media. Um, it's actually going to grow about $5.8 this year in net new ad spend, bigger than Meta and Google combined will. So where are all these dollars going to come from into retail media? Uh, there's a study by BCG and Google that looked at the expected growth from 2021 to 2026, and it identified the key buckets that they expected the new spend to come from. Um, one of the biggest or the biggest is organic growth in digital. It's going to move disproportionately in the direction of retail media, but also other digital platforms as some of these digital budgets start to rationalize. And then traditional media, that $10 billion slice um, is largely TV. 
Then you get into a couple of areas that are not net new spend for retailers. Um, it actually would cannibalize from existing spend with them in terms of trade and shopper marketing spend. But it's going to come from everywhere. Now, Amazon currently leads the retail media market by a, a pretty large sum. They've got about three quarters of the market. But I always say that the future of retail media goes through grocery. And grocery, actually, grocery e-commerce is a very competitive space. You can see Walmart out ahead by a bit, uh, but Amazon and Instacart very close, all of them with market share between 20 and 25% or so. You also have Kroger, who's a key player. And if they were to merge with Albertsons, which may or may not happen, uh, that would be another player with about 15% market share. So all of a sudden you could have four really key players, highly competitive. And you know I think this is where the competition really helps retail media evolve and blossom. The ANA just put out some research that showed the top retail media networks used by marketers. And I noticed something interesting in the list that of all of the top ones, as I worked my way down the list, each of the top 13 RMNs on the list, actually all trafficked in grocery and CPG. So that also goes to speak to just how significant grocery is to the development of this market. You know, all the other ones at the bottom of the list, by the way, no slouches. These are some great retail media networks, but it shows where the brands really are concentrated today. Now, brands are starting to diversify what they're doing on retail media networks, and they're buying across many different formats. The most common is on-site owned and operated content, uh, largely search, but they're also getting into offsite display, offsite video, um, advertising through retailers' newsletters, and then increasingly in-store digital out of home. We're gonna talk about a lot of these throughout the presentation. So I think of retail media as really hitting an inflection point where we're really shifting between the retail media 1.0 era and the 2.0 era. The 1.0 era is what got us to where we are today, which is broadly search, search advertising sponsored products in retail media parlance. So let's talk about that. So here's the growth of that market over the last several years. You can see from 2019, it was less than 10 billion. We're gonna see it hit about 30 billion this year. And it's a bigger and bigger slice of the search market overall, about 27% this year, about 30% about of that market by next year. But there's so much innovation happening in search. So I'm going to walk you through one of the key changes that's happened in the search uh, market in retail media this year. And you can see through this illustration just how much new value can be untapped. So Amazon was really kind of the earliest and most mature in search and has a well-developed marketplace. Instacart stood up their business pretty quickly and also reached uh, a level of maturity very quickly. And you can see consistent levels of return on ad spend coming out of those products and those retail media networks over the last several quarters, about four and a half to five dollars um, quarter by quarter. Walmart, um, and a lot of what, what those two did, by the way, they had second price auctions as central to their marketplace model. And Walmart didn't have that second price auction model um, and they hadn't built out some different aspects of their search algorithm and their marketplace uh, quite as much, but they made some huge tweaks in Q2 of 2022, um, in June specifically. And what you saw almost instantly was that cost per clicks went down on Walmart because advertisers no longer were bidding against themselves. They were bidding against the next most competitive bid and just paying a penny more than that. And so return on ad spend as a result grew very significantly. So it came to parity in Q2 of last year and then rocketed up into the $6 range. Year over year, it's up 83%. Now, retail media networks, um, and you'll notice the ones shown here, are all really heavily invested in the marketplace model. That is a big part of what helps monetization. Monetization across all these networks is improving. Now, this is a calculation of average revenue per user. Um, it's my own calculation. I use Comscore data for average monthly unique visitors for all of these um, e-commerce sites, and then our ad spend estimates and divided the two. And obviously Amazon is the, the longest standing, biggest and most mature, um, is, is has a very high average revenue per user and continues to grow, but so is Instacart and Walmart. In fact, Walmart's up 34% uh, for many of the reasons that I just mentioned year over year. eBay and Etsy, I mean, these are vibrant marketplaces, even at four and $3, there's, there's just tons of upside for all of these different markets. So I think that's a case why we need to think about search driving continued growth. 
but that's Retail Media 1.0. And now things are getting more interesting with Retail Media 2.0. So I think the future of retail media advertising is going to have three distinct growth drivers. And those are one, moving up the funnel, two, omni-channel sales attribution, and three, in-store retail media. So let's talk about this move up the funnel. So we recently released a forecast, the first time we've done this, that shows retail media off-site digital ad revenues. It's a smaller slice of the market, about 14% of the market today, but you can see it's starting to grow quickly and we expect it to surpass 6 billion this year, growing at about 38% year over year. That's about twice the rate of what the rest of the market will grow at. So much more aggressive growth. And if you look at the shape of this curve, it's a curve, it's not linear. We're seeing some kind of exponential forces. So to me, this also helps speak to the inflection point that we're reaching at the current state in time. Now, as retail media ads move further up the funnel, the different into different ad formats, uh, they work differently. So let's work our way up this graph from bottom to top. So at the bottom of the funnel is sponsored product ads, search. And what you can see here from this data from Perpetua and Wark is that the vast majority of them, about three quarters, actually convert in uh, less than two hours. Most of them are probably pretty immediate. Once you get into the demand side platform, those DSP ads on Amazon, you're talking about display and video ads around the web. About half of those convert in less than one day. The other half convert outside of one day. Then OTT advertising or streaming TV that's very different. This is way up the funnel. And you see that about three quarters of those ads actually convert outside of one day with 40% converting outside of seven days. So there's a very latent effect of that branding impact ultimately driving conversion. Now, I think this streaming opportunity, the streaming TV opportunity in retail media is significant and really is gonna disrupt the TV advertising industry as we know it, because for the first time, you're going to have TV quality ads underpinned by first party targeting data and closed loop attribution. Um, brand buyers are trying to invest more deeply into these formats. In fact, it's catching up with their use of search and display banner ads. About 65% are buying into CTV now. Some of the key formats to think about with retail media networks are Amazon, they actually just acquired rights to Thursday Night Football. This happened uh, this past year. So they're able now to use their advertising apparatus and deliver these ads against TV-like ads. Uh, Walmart partnered with the Trade Desk. That gave access to a lot of connected TV inventory. Uh, they also have a partnership with Roku on shoppable TV. Uh, Roku also has a partnership with Kroger for using their data for closed-loop targeting and attribution. So all of these sorts of partnerships, and there's probably going to be more that we see this year, um, are really driving the growth in this opportunity. So next is on omnichannel sales attribution. So I've always said that right now we're seeing online ads drive online sales, and that's a small piece of the equation. There's another 85% of sales that are happening in retail stores, and they're not being accounted for in that return on ad spend equation yet. When that happens, it's going to be really significant. And brands want that. They want that full view into sales that are influenced by digital ads. Um, we asked them, what are the most important attributes in a retail media network? And they said, number one and number two were traffic quality and traffic scale. That speaks to the search opportunity. But number three was in-store and omni-channel sales data. So there's a lot of potential here, and it's what brands want to complete that picture. They're also looking for a more sophisticated understanding of that attribution. They know when it's offline sales, they don't just want to see that a sale happened after an ad exposure occurred uh, because it may not have been caused by that ad exposure. And so the metrics that they deem most valuable when assessing camp campaign performance, while they all have to do with return on ad spend, the number one on the list is incremental sales. So you're going to start hearing a lot more about incremental ROAS or iROAS as the years progress and specifically in CPG world um, when we're thinking about offline sales. Now, another issue that's cropped up this year uh, with regards to attribution and other areas is there's a lack of standardization across retail media platforms. Uh, this jumped up to the top of the list as being the biggest challenge among advertisers according to the ANA. And the lack of standardization plays out in retail media with things like different attribution windows. 
Um, maybe it's seven days, 14 days, or 28 days. So there's a lack of consistency there in how a retail media network might be grading their own homework. Next was walled garden environments. And one of the things that you get there, again, when you're reporting sales lift for your own network is you don't have that full view if you're a national advertiser into multi-retailer sales lift. Um, so I think we're going to see the development of some multi-retailer sales lift solutions from a Nielsen IQ, Catalina, or IRI. The last one I want to highlight is timeliness of data and analytics. Um, the offline data often comes in not quickly enough. And so that feedback loop that really allows for optimizations in digital ads, um, it doesn't allow for that. So we're going to see that feedback loop continue to, to progress and get faster uh, over the course of the next year or two. The last one is the rise of in-store retail media, one that I'm particularly excited about. I'm actually writing quite a bit on it at the moment. So the, the trend that's really driving this is the digitization of the store. And that's in not enabling the rise of in-store retail media across a lot of different digital surfaces. You can see here from the Path to Purchase Institute study where they asked shoppers about the frequency with which they noticed different ads that brand displays on shelves, that's one of the key surfaces, um, which includes the cooler aisle, that's getting the most notice, but you're also seeing a lot of notice of video ads on TV screens, video screens at the gas pump, digital screens at checkout, in-store audio, and digital displays at EV uh, charging stations. So these are a lot of the most common uh, incarnations, but we're also seeing screens start to find different places in the store as well. So it's a really vibrant space that's innovating very quickly. So I like to say that in-store retail media is gonna prove that physical stores are the next major mass media channel. One way you can see that is through the size of the audiences. So we're looking here at 13 different brick and mortar retailers and they all have strong retail media businesses online. And those digital audiences are in black. You'll notice the in-store audiences are in most cases much bigger. In Walmart's case, 212 million versus about 144 million. Um, target, over 100 million in-store shoppers. We need to start thinking of this store traffic as eyeballs that brands can reach in a contextually relevant brand safe environment that provides a lot of the benefits that TV traditionally has provided. Uh, these audiences, by the way, on average among these 13 that we looked at is 69% higher in-store than online, just to put that in perspective. So one of the other key benefits akin to TV is that physical stores have an ability to reach the unreachables, those younger audiences, Gen Zs and millennials, maybe younger Gen Xers, who are harder and harder to reach through linear TV. In TV, we always talk about the, the traditional money demo of age 18 to 49 year olds. And what we can see is in-store shoppers at a number of retailers that we looked at, um, all of them have a very high percentage of those shoppers, at least about two thirds. In the case of Sephora, uh, 83%. In each case with every one of these re retailers, they significantly over index for reaching these populations. So this is a highly efficient way of reaching hard to reach audiences. Oh, and by the way, they don't second screen in stores like they do if they're actually watching TV and you're lucky enough to reach them. So it's almost a perfect uh, way to help substitute for what you're missing in TV today. So that concludes the presentation. And with that, I am going to pass it back to Jasmine. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was fantastic as always. It is just so incredible to see how quickly retail media has grown and in such a short period of time. And retail media is of course, something that we talk quite a lot about on the social desk here at Insider Intelligence as well. We believe that it's going to be quite a big challenge or it already is quite a big challenge to the social platforms ad businesses, particularly in light of all of the struggles that they went through over the past year. But we also think that it might be a pretty strong impetus for them to innovate and perhaps roll out new ad formats um, related to search. And one thing that struck me in Andrew's presentation was when he was talking about all the vibrant marketplaces. And Facebook, of course, has a pretty vibrant marketplace itself called Facebook Marketplace. And that seems like it would be a pretty logical place to start. 
My colleague Debbie Williamson will be talking a lot more on a panel about social and, and retail media. Um, but for now, it's back over to you, Andrew, who is joined by Rich Lairfeld, Senior Vice President and General Manager at Walmart Connect. Thank you, Jasmine. Well, I'm so excited to have Rich Lairfeld here with us today, uh, SVP and GM of Walmart Connect. Um, Walmart has a great story to tell, as you could see through some of the slides. Um, so much innovation in the business. And, you know, I think obviously all the innovations that are happening both in search that we talked about and the future of retail media. So Rich, uh, welcome. Uh, it's great to have you here today. It's, it's incredible to be here. Thank you guys. We are, we're big fans. Uh, thank you for the, and the presentation was incredible. I really enjoyed it. It was really nice to see uh, Walmart show up some of the top of the list. Um, we're making a lot of progress. Um, it's in a very vibrant industry. And, and just exciting, it's exciting time. It, it is an exciting time and exciting despite the fact that there's this backdrop of economic uncertainty and maybe some softness in the ad markets, but uh, but retail media is bucking the trend. Yeah. Um, you know, is it fair to say that we're really at an inflection point? I would say yes. Uh, and I, I try to go back to like what's happening and why, why retail media, why now? I'm not sure I know um, like the path, the path of why it hasn't happened, but I can say what's happening now. And there's a, definitely a bunch of trends that are changing uh, our environment that are allowing retail media to really thrive. And I'll give you, I'll give you a couple if that, that's okay. Please. I mean, first is really uh, advertisers are going to ha having to do more with less, right? So as inflation goes up, as margins uh, get uh, condensed, uh, they're looking for impact. And uh, there's there's a lot of great channels, a lot of great media companies out there. But when you think about retail media, the impact that retail media companies can really make on the customer at the point of purchase um, and really uh, influence those sales, uh, there's probably nothing greater than to be able to do that. I'd say the second thing is accountability. So we're all trying to get measurement. I was a media buyer for a very long time. Accountability in your all your dollars and making sure everything was measured. You knew what was happening with all those dollars. Retail media is incredible like that because, again, the sales are happening right then and there, or if they're happening a little later, you still can track to that customer or that, that user, if it's an online user, of when that sale is happening. The third trend that I would say uh, is really important is brand safety. Um, we're all concerned about um, where, your where your brand is, how data is being used, cookie list world. Um, the retail media and Walmart are very safe environments to really put your brands and feel comfortable that... Um, it's not going to be in a place that you're not sure where it is. And the data that's being collected, it's in a safe environment that you can feel good about. And I would say the last one is really about connections, right? You're looking for mul your dollars to go in multiple connections. And when you look at retail media, I think you showed wh whether that's on platform or off platform or in store, there's many ways to connect with customers. And you look at, if we use a traditional funnel, upper funnel to mid funnel to lower funnel, I do believe the funnels are collapsing in the middle because information and data is allowing uh, marketers to really connect with customers and then get the measurement in the way they want it. So when you look at those four things together, it really leads into retail media as a place where dollars can be very, very, very effective. And the performance, that makes it an easy sell, sure. right? But there's so much more. I love that you, sure. you brought it to brand safety. Can I just say, we have not talked about brand safety nearly enough as a value proposition. It's a huge value proposition of retail media. Yeah, I, I would say, listen, as we start to move upper funnel, mid funnel, there will be, there are questions about brand safety, but the, the, the notion of where retail media is really strongest on platform, um, in store, it's a safe environment that you're gonna feel comfortable where your brand's gonna be. And then the other thing is, as we, as an industry use data in a safe way, we have big first party data sets. And we need to make sure as an industry that we're using it in a safe way where our, the marketers um, and the, the retailers can feel safe and the, ultimately the customer. We want the customer to feel safe that our brand promise that we're not going to use their data in, in nefarious ways. It's done in a safe way um, that uh, we all feel good about. So Walmart recently reported Q4 earnings. Um, it, it was a nice quarter. Uh, some of the highlights were 17% year over year growth in e-commerce, which was well ahead of uh, the industry benchmark. And uh, more impressively, the the 41% growth at Walmart Connect business, right? So not just a great number, but also an acceleration in the business from previous quarters. Um, what's behind this? And, and can we say that Walmart Connect is at an inflection point? <laughs> uh, again, I would say yes. 
Um, I think you addressed some of those in, actually in your presentation, which is which is great. You know, uh, many things on the platform, we're getting to that level of maturity. I would say like, you know, you crawl, walk, run, we're in, in Walmart Connect, we're getting to that walk to run phase now where our platform is maturing. Search is key. You showed search is key. Building a platform that can really deliver for advertisers, moving to the second price auction, um, expanding relevancy so more uh, players can come in. And then really uh, a marketplace, not just a one P where great suppliers, we love our partners and suppliers, but allowing everybody to plan the platform and marketplace has really allowed us to do that. And really what we're starting to see is um, we've, we've grown, we've grown search uh, pretty, pretty dramatically. A active advertisers over hundred percent, three P advertisers over hundred percent, more people can participate. So when you look at the platform, it's just an incredible place for all advertisers or suppliers or sellers of all size sizes to really, really uh, see performance on the platform. And then of course the accelerant of second price auction and allowing more uh, advertisers to play on the platform is helping them. That second price auction, it seems like it's a, it's a gravitational force that pulls more brands in because sure. they feel like they can invest so much more confidently. Sure. Um, now your CEO, Doug McMillan has spoken about how these digital businesses enable Walmart's flywheel. And I, I think you've, built a, a really compelling flywheel that's starting to accelerate now. Um, he said specifically, one example is how our growth in e-commerce, especially the marketplace fuels our ad business. More items uh, and sellers drive GMV, gross merchandise value, and improved customer satisfaction. It also drives success in advertising. They're mutually reinforcing. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so it, it, in some ways, uh, you know, I, when you really start to think about the notion of um, having a 3P market, a healthy, vibrant 3P marketplace, it really starts to make sense on why it's so good for customers, our suppliers and our partners and Walmart overall. And you would say, great, you have more people in, you have more, um, you're, you're getting revenue. And it's, it's actually more than that. Because if you think about a vibrant marketplace, any vibrant marketplace, um, you need to make sure that you have enough players in that marketplace. So when someone, and we'll say search, because search is the key for most marketplace sellers to really come into the platform, um, relevancy to go up. When you have more players in the platform, the customer will see more options. So dis discovery will go up. Uh, hopefully inspiration will go up. Your relevancy go up because more players are within that. And, and again, a second price auction, it is a marketplace and more people are bidding on uh, keywords. So relevancy goes up. That means the customer benefits, they're getting more options. Hopefully suppliers and sellers uh, have more options to get their, their products at the top of the, the in-grid. Um, if you're a marketplace seller, maybe in the past, um, you, if, if you had a new product, you couldn't, they couldn't see it. And now you can because you're actually at, getting at the top. And then for Walmart, it's really great because, again, relevancy goes up. Uh, it's nice. The ad revenue is great, but relevancy goes up and then the whole flywheel really kicks in. So it really is um, from, from an ad perspective and, and a marketplace perspective to be able to really have these marketplace sellers come in um, and really add to the vibrancy of the whole marketplace platform. Yeah. I mean, you're giving some, some great points to highlight. You gave me brand safety a minute ago. Relevancy. Yeah. Again, we're not talking about this enough. It is so critical. And that is where so much of that value resides in search. It's also what can turn customers away if you're providing irrelevant search results. Yeah. Um, but it, it's what really is the foundation of that flywheel, as you said. Um, let's start moving up the funnel a little bit. So Walmart Connect keeps adding different ad formats. You've inked quite a few partnerships uh, that help brands move up the funnel. Um, a lot of those have pertained specifically to video efforts. Um, tell me about some of your latest offerings and, and how those are going. Yeah. So. Uh... Again, retail media has always been really strong um, in a platform, in a marketplace perspective, in a digital perspective, um, but it has been somewhat contained. But what we realize is marketers want more options, right? They want to reach customers where they are as they're going through the internet um, and they're doing different types of interactions. Again, inspiration, discovery, um, wherever they are across the internet. So as we started to think about how we build out a platform, we knew it was going to be really important to build an um, an off-platform business. And then we start to think about off-platform. Where are users? Where are customers? Um, where are uh, people? Where are they going? They're going social. They're looking at news and information, right? They're on uh, connected TV as the world moves to connected TV. So we thought it was really important to build value propositions where um, we could reach, we can use our information data in a safe way and then reach those customers as they were doing different things. So we thought partnerships were really important. We've built out partnerships, whether that's TikTok or Snapchat, 
um, or Roku, building out different nuances that are what their platform strength, strengths are, um, and really then have better targeting and find customers. So uh, Walmart and joint um, viewers, where are, where are they uh, engaging? Um, then be able to activate against those users and then measure, right? We, what we want to be able to do is make sure we can do all of those things really well. So we wanted to work with partners that have reach, that have scale like Walmart, um, but that we're also talking to customers in a unique way um, so we can open the aperture and add more value to advertisers. And, and you're hitting customers at every phase of the funnel. So you're really getting yeah. this full funnel experience sure. and at the same time sure. closing the loop. Sure, we're really good at... Um, we're really good at activating or, or reaching customers as they're in their shopping journey. That's where we're really strong. That's traditionally where retail media networks are. Um, but opening up the aperture, because we know not everybody's in a shopping mindset or shopping journey um, to be where they are, where they're engaging, where they're interacting. It might be fun. It might be utility um, and try to be there. And we know, like again, we want to be a full funnel service for our partners or advertisers or suppliers or sellers to give them more options because we know it's not one size fits all. And they can look more holistically at a marketing funnel and an engagement funnel. And we, we tend to think of this funnel as, you know, search and display and even into yeah. TV. The last piece of that, though, is in store. We'll get to that in, in one moment. But it's I mean, it is really full funnel when you think about it. Uh, but before we do that, let's talk a little bit about omni-channel attribution. Um, an area, like I said, 85 percent of sales are happening offline. Yeah. And Walmart has the biggest store footprint yeah. nationally. Um, and you also serve, you know, not just grocery, obviously, yeah. all the categories. So it's kind of a unique position. Um, tell me about, you know, omni and omni-channel attribution yeah. at Walmart, where it's at. Obviously, it's it's a challenge. It's been a challenge for the whole industry to make yeah. everything work really tightly. Where are you at with it today? Yeah. So so whole, holistically, we we want to make sure that again, as I said, where we are, where our customers are, and the value of us and and retail media and the promise of that retail media is making sure that we can reach them where where that customer is shopping. And if you look at Walmart, who is you know the largest retailer, um, we reach over ninety percent of Americans. Uh, we have forty seven hundred stores. Majority of our uh, sales are happening in store. We want to make sure that we can have value propositions that can reach customers in that mode. Um, so as you start to look at that a value proposition, you start to look at in store, uh, whereas where we're spending a lot of time, it is a it is a challenge when you one of the values of Walmart, one of the great things of Walmart is the size and the scale that we have. Again, like I said, forty seven hundred stores, um, a lot of customers. Um, but when you have a value proposition that goes into store in a live environment, you move from like a one to one digital is a one to one promise. I know I don't may not track exactly you, but I know you as a user. When you start to go in store, it's one to many in many ways. We do have value propositions that we know exactly who the customer is at that time. But for the most part, when you're building out a large digital out of home or, or an out of home or uh, an experiential sort of value proposition, you're talking to so many customers. Um, and so you look at the value of retail media, then you say, okay, well, it's really about knowing who that customer is. It's activating against that customer and then measuring that customer. So as we start to look at in-store, an incredible opportunity for us, we want to build it in the right way. First of all, we have to build it in a customer-centric way. We don't want to be interruptive into their shopping experience. We want to be additive to their, interrupt their shopping experience. So how do we help with discovery and inspiration um, and experience? And so we, we're thinking about value propositions that can do that. And then working on the challenge of that, it's ultimately how do we measure the impact? Because if you're an advertiser and you're working with us, you want to know, am I lifting sales? Is it just sales I was getting anyway, or is it incremental sales? So the challenges are how do you build a scalable value proposition that can really deliver all those things for advertisers? And that's what we're doing. Um, we're building out measurement capabilities. We're bu building out new experiences um, like demos and events, uh, screens in store, um, and many other areas that we think are very exciting. And I, even in your presentation, you show like the, it's not the future, it's here of how you can actually reach customers in an experiential way and not just in a flat screen, but in a very interactive way, which is the screens are great, but interactivity, I think is, is going to add a whole nother dimension to value and impact. Yeah. I mean, these are high quality surfaces, sure. right? And, and I don't know if you have any favorite surfaces that you want to mention, but there's a lot of digital surfaces and places you can go into the store. You have to be mindful of the customer experience, but 
high quality branding. And then, as you said, you can build in some interactivity. Sure. So again, it's this, this idea, you can do branding and performance sure. um, in the most contextually re relevant environment there is. That's exactly right. So experiential is going to be key. Of course, you'll have screens maybe at the deli counter or, or somewhere else that'll uh, deliver value for advertisers and have impact, but the interactivity of that. And then the other piece, which you we are building out, and I'm sure many people are building out, is how do you build digital to uh, live, right? Consumers don't, they're not just in store for the most part. They're not just digital, they're omni shoppers. So how do we bridge that where maybe they were shopping for a few things online and then they go in store to get it uh, to make sure that is holistically. I, I get excited about things where, you know, we, we you can do these things and, and we're building towards these things. We don't have them. So I'm not saying I'll, I'll give you like where my head is, is when they show up in this, Pre-store, in-store, how do you give them what the deals are? What are the hot products? What are the new products? Um, where should they go to find these things? Um, and then integrating uh, advertisers or marketers to be able to deliver those messages and deliver that value. But it has to be customer-centric and it has to be value. We're not going to just um, pump more and more ads on things. It's about experience. And that's where you're going to start to see um, incredible growth in the in-store experience. And again, value for the customer value for the uh, advertiser supplier and value for Walmart because it's going to be um, it's going to be a great experience for a customer. And that's what customers are saying they want. I was just looking at research where the number one thing that they want with in-store media are promotions. Okay, not a surprise. They love those. <laughs> of course. But but after that it was they wanted great creative. Right. They wanted uh you you know to see yep. uh, unique products and, and things of that nature. Um, as we wrap up, you know, there's so many fascinating dimensions so what's happening in retail media today? I have a hard time choosing, but I'm going to ask you to choose. What's most exciting to you of, of all these avenues of innovation? I've been asked that question. I have a, I have a harder time because it's sort of like all your children, right? So all the things that you're doing are exciting. Um, I always find it, um, you know, what we're doing in attribution, what we're doing in um, new experiences, what we're doing in automation, what we're doing in um, advertisers, especially for the smaller advertisers like the marketplace advertisers, automation, self-serve tools, those are all exciting. I am a brand marketer at heart. So when I think when you, you talk about the upper funnel to mid funnel, some of the I think exciting things are how do you how do you build out um, more upper traditional upper funnel connected TV, shopper um, uh, opportunities in and unique content. Those things really excite me, but I, I have to say everything's exciting. This is an exciting time in the industry. I'm so happy you're covering this. Uh, and happy to be here in this this time of uh, retail media. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Rich. Uh, this was a fascinating conversation. I feel like we could go on for two hours, but <laughs> I, agree. I think we'll have to leave it there. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Uh, and good luck to you. <laughs> thank you. All right. Back to you, Jasmine. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Andrew. That was so fantastic. If you enjoyed our keynote today, look out for our next Attention Summit, which will take place on June 2nd and focus on streaming and the new digital ad economy. We'll be sending information on that soon. But next up, we have Ethan Chernovsky, the Senior Vice President of Marketing at Placer.ai, and he will have a deep dive discussion with Insider Intelligence Vice President Marissa Koslov on how to lean into brick and mortar's advertising revival. You can join Ethan and Marissa by clicking on the tab below the video that says next session. And I hope you're not tired of me yet because I'm not going anywhere. I'll see you again at 2.05 p.m. Eastern for our Ask the Analyst panel. Thank you.